mark you'd like to leave with our attendees as we wrap up today. Carl, we'll begin with you. Sure. Look, um, hopefully this was informative, uh, and it's been a pleasure to um, be on here with Aaron and Michael and to be able to talk about this topic, which I find both personally and professionally fascinating. Um, again, I mean, the takeaway here is that these medicines were crushed for many years and they are roaring back with a very significant therapeutic value and a very significant social benefit. But of course, what carries with it is to what degree and what guardrails are going to be put, put around these medicines? What is going to become the perception of the safety of the use of these medications outside of a therapeutic or strictly ritualistic um, scenario? In fact, this is something that's being revisited right now in Colorado as to whether they want to scale back in some fashion the relatively broad law that they passed only a year ago. So um, it's an exciting and evolving area, and I know I'm going to be enjoy uh, keeping an eye on things. Uh, I agree, it is an exciting uh, and evolving area, and you know we discussed some of the legal exceptions to the uh, establishment of churches and utiliz utilization of psychedelics. But I think it's important for everyone to know that you know even if it's legal federally doesn't necessarily make it legal under state law. A lot of the, the things that I discussed specifically were some federal exemptions. Those may not apply in California. Uh, you know, if the California government decides that it wants to make uh, you know, any of these substances illegal, just because there may be a federal exception to it, uh, again, does not necessarily mean in all cases that, um, you know, uh, that California would allow it, for example. So I think that that's something to be um, extremely clear on as well. And that the laws are changing, but it's still illegal. Um, you know, I'm still a criminal defense attorney, and I still anticipate on you know seeing these cases come through the courts until we have very clear legislative change or clarification from the government. So I would just caution everyone to be careful when you know if, if deciding to go into a venture related to psychedelics. An excellent topic. It's you know wide open right now. Um, I, I do want to say that the opportunities that exist are not, you know, just focused on, you know, Oregon service centers and facilitators, you know, in person. It's also that there is a huge uh, market for, you know, a, a wider audience, of course, that goes along with all of those, um, you know, the major human ailments, um, neurological human ailments from uh, depression, anxiety. PTSD, addiction, um, obsessive compulsive disorders, um, to sleep and pain, and all of those really have um, an addressable market that is that is enormous, obviously, and you know that's not that's not being ignored. Um, the the companies that are historically already involved in you know the antidepressant market, the anxiety anti-anxiety market, so. Um, serving patients with those types of ailments. I mean, it's it's all the big pharma. So it's GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Eli Lilly. It's all of the big ones. And of course, those those big pharma companies do all have um, uh, their own venture funds. Uh, most of them, Merck has M Ventures, and you know GlaxoSmithKline has SR1. There's Leaps by Bear. Um, there's the Novartis Venture Fund. They, they are, they are interested, um, and of course, they see that there are several, um, numerous actually, psychedelic-focused VC firms that are competing. So there, there's a lot of energy around the space, and there is a significant interest by big pharma to protect their market share um, in all of the, you know, key markets, antidepressants, anxiety, pain, sleep.